The first thing about leadership is there are many personalities and temperaments, and that translates into a wide variety of leadership styles. But there are traits and skill sets that every great leader has. Here's Jordan Peterson and some of his guests, including Jonathan Peugeot, discussing leadership. What makes a good leader? Why people give leaders power to begin with? How good leaders lead effectively, maintain power, get good results from their team, and much more. Here's the 22 Laws of Leadership. I'm relatively familiar with the psychological uh, research on leadership, which I think is generally quite a mess. And I think the reason for that is that it isn't obvious that leadership is a homogenous category. There's many different ways of, leader, of leading, but I would also say that there's probably some commonalities. Like, it seems to me, for example, that one of the primary attributes of a leader who's worth his or her salt, let's say, is the ability to instill and also deserve trust among the people that they work with. They tend to do a tremendous amount of work to try to understand the organization that they're in fact leading and from the bottom up. So they tend to know the organization inside out and backwards. And then they do a tremendous amount of listening and aggregating, you know, because if you go into an organization and you discuss the structure and the challenges of the organization with the people who are actually in the trenches, especially near the bottom, I would say, they'll tell you how the organization works and then you can aggregate and synthesize and reflect back. And, and that seems to be associated with your idea of that reciprocal relationship between the leadership and the people who are hypothetically following. There's a, there's a um, research showing what makes a physician an effective diagnostician. And one of the markers is the number of words that the patient speaks compared to the number of words the physician speaks in the first 15 minutes of their interaction. And the more words the patient speaks, the higher the diagnostic accuracy of the physician. And I really like that idea of humility. You know, you, you have to walk into a complex situation knowing that you don't know anything, including what the problems are. And then if you have the possibility of listening, if you have the opportunity to listen, then and people trust you, that which is a real crucial issue and something that's maybe central to leadership, then people will actually tell you what the problems are and what's actually going on. And that seems to be a prerequisite for, for solving them, right? You actually have to know what the problems are. Yeah, well, it's the problem with walking in with a bag of solutions is that you have the steering wheel, but it's not connected to any of the mechanism. But there's this really this sense that the, the head or the or the, the the king or the chief exists for the for the the, the benefit of those that are the lowest that are the lowest. Right, right. right. And, and, so, that's and continually so that, that's continually insisted upon in the Old Testament. Yeah. Because the prophets always come up and say to the king, you're not attending sufficiently yeah. to the widows and the orphans. Yeah. And that means that you've become corrupt. Yeah. And so in a way, you can kind of see the hierarchy moving up in the sense of things looking up towards, you know, into the hierarchy. But then there's also a really important manner in which the hierarchy moves down. And so the idea is that the top of the hierarchy exists for the bottom of the hierarchy. It's like and so that so the top of the hierarchy in a, in a really important way is a sac is a sacrificial existence. And so the highest thing is 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 there the highest thing is the one that sacrifices itself for those that are that well, are... you can think about that. You can think about that practically as the willingness of a father to care for an infant. Yeah, because it's not that easy to define leadership, and partly because there are different. You know, you, people have different temperaments, and different temperaments can be leaders. They just do it in different ways. Now, there's something in common about being a leader, though, and I would say one is that if you're an actual leader, you actually know where you're going, right? Because what are you going to do? Lead people in circles? It's like, maybe they'll follow you, but you're not a leader. You're just a charlatan. So you have to know where you're going. And then you have to be able to communicate that. And then people have to trust you. So you actually have to be honest because people aren't that stupid, at least not for a long period of time. And then where you're going has to have some value because otherwise, why would anyone want to go along with you? So, and then you might say, well, what, what are the attributes then that make you a leader? And I would say, well, they're characterological fundamentally. And this is not naive optimism or, or, or casual moralizing. It has nothing to do with that. You know, we know, for example, that conscientiousness, the, the personality trait, is a good predictor of long-term success 
in, in most occupations, not all, but most, and that one of the things that's associated with conscientiousness is that people keep their word, they're trustworthy. And that's certainly one element of a leader, especially across any reasonable amount of time. You have to be able to trust the person. They can even be harsh, right? It doesn't matter, because you can see harsh leaders and kind leaders. But as long as they do what they say they will do, then, then you can follow them and you know that the future payoff is, is, is secure, something like that. So, the idea that characterological development is more important to leadership than primogenitor, I think that's the right word, uh, primogenesis, anyways, being a firstborn, that's a very crucial psychological realization, that it's characterological development that makes you favored of God, you know, and I do think we've forgotten this in many ways, because there isn't a lot of emphasis in our education system on characterological development. And that's very, very surprising to me. I think maybe it's partly because in our fractured society we can't agree on what constitutes a reasonable characterological goal. So we just throw up our hands and don't educate our kids to any degree at all, especially in schools, about what an admirable person is like, or even let them know that, well, maybe you should actually try to be one, you know, that that's actually the most important possible thing that you could learn, right? And, of course, the infant also has that potential, which is why the infant is made sacred as well in, in, that, in that symbolic realm. Yeah. So the highest is serving the lowest. The lowest is the infant, let's say, because right. it's most helpless. But the infant is also the future of the hierarchy. Yeah. And so, the, I mean, I think that that really, it, and I, I, we've talked about this before slightly, is that the, the, the notion that the Christian hero you know, is slightly is actually slightly different from the, the the pagan hero, for example. So the knight, let's say in Western Christianity, the knight would be the 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 archetypal image of the Christian uh, hero, which is the notion of an aristocrat, a a warrior, you know, a, a soldier whose purpose is not to it is not only to gain honor on himself. But in a way, he gains honor on himself by sacrificing himself for those who can't do it. And so he, his honor is based on the fact that he's willing to fight for the, for the widow, for the orphan, for those that, that don't have the strength to fight for themselves. And so obviously, in reality, that doesn't always play out. I mean, but, but the ideal is there and the ideal is real. And it's, it's the basis of all our, all our hero movies, all our hero stories always had this idea of the, the hero is the person who's willing to use their strength and their power to to defend to, the weak. To, to, yeah, to sacrifice themselves for the for the weak, uh, which is very different from the pagan hero. Like, uh, you know, Achilles. Right, where weakness, weakness was contemptible under those circumstances. Right. And also it's like it, the only purpose was to at attain honor on ourselves. So Achilles is sitting in his tent and he's moping and whining because we've taken away his sex slave and he won't go back to fight until it affects him personally, you know, but he, he, he's actually not, he doesn't care that much about helping, you know, the Greeks and their cause. He's really doing that, doing things for his own honor. And so he's perfectly heroic in sitting in his tent and moping and not going back into, into battle you know, because his honor has been attained. Whereas in Christianity, you know, in, in stories like, uh, like if you see Sir Gawain and, and uh, you, you read um, the, 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 the Knight and a Cart, for example, that idea of Lancelot who is willing to be seen as a, as a, as a criminal, as a, you know, as the worst kind of person in order to save the helpless damsel in distress. You know, he's, he's willing to sacrifice all his honor in order to help that, that person who is in danger. So it's a really, it's a very different way of seeing the world. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know what to say after all of that. <laughs> How does I mean, that fit in the whole thing? But well, it fits I mean, in the idea of the cross. No, like, no, I'm, that's no the cross. absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, suggesting at all that that was not relevant to the to what we've been discussing. It's dead relevant. I really like the idea. I know we've talked about the fact that the, you know, I've been conceptualizing Christ as the not as the apex of the hierarchy, symbolically speaking, but the apex to such a degree that it actually detaches itself from the hierarchy, sort of like Horus, the the uh, the the, the uh, osprey or the what what the hell is he a uh, falcon. In, in, in Egyptian symbolism, right? He's the thing that flies above everything that can see, or the Egyptian eye. And your correction was that 
it's not exact it, once you're detached in some sense you're not at the top anymore you're everywhere right you're spread throughout the entire structure which yeah. is a, which is a very good way of looking at it right and the story of christ is in his story and in his symbolism you see that he he's at the top of the dome let's say in the church where he's really exactly what you're saying this kind of de this kind of detached uh, top of the hierarchy but then he also stretches all the way down into death into hades into to chaos and the cross is the other side where you know he's he's outside of the city being being killed by by his friends, by the, you know, he's the, the outcast, he's all of those things. And so he, he unites the two extremes of the hierarchy together and fills the hierarchy with, with Well, and with the, the idea that he transcends death, again, I'm just going to take this from a psychological perspective mm -hmm. because the theological waters are getting too deep for me here. <laughs> and uh, Well, they are because I don't understand it exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm really trying to work it out, but I don't understand it well enough yet. But exactly, I, the, the builder rejected. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things I've I've come to understand about tyrannies is that if you have a tyr tyrannical person at the top, the tyranny isn't just at the top. The tyranny is mirrored right. all the yeah, way through the entire yeah. hierarchy, right? Yeah. It's like a, like a um, what are those three D holographs? It's like that, a hologram. It's like a hologram. Every part is a reflection of the whole, and so I wonder if that's analogous. If if you have a a pyramid, say, with the principle of the divine hero at the top, then what happens is that's reflected at every single level of the of the hierarchy, yeah, just it like it would be. be with the tyranny. Right. Yeah, it should be, except that. Yeah, except that the 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 yeah the tyranny is will be just that that kind of up down like the top down you know light that shines down and kind of puts everything in place, and then when it reaches the things that it doesn't. That it can't uh, absorb, it'll just it'll completely cut them off. You know, like it'll kill them, it'll burn them off. You know, it'll just destroy them. Ninety nine point nine percent of seals would agree on what makes you a good seal, and that is you look out for your teammates. You put your team above yourself. Yeah, so that's a real inversion of the things that you just described, Dave, because all of those things are dimensions along which you could be excellent in a manner that distinguishes you from the group and elevates you above them. But you derive from that a claim that that should all be subordinate to a reciprocity. And any SEAL that's a good SEAL would tell you that that would be at the top of the hierarchy. You can be okay, the so best flip. shot, yep. you can be the best shot, you can be the best diver, you can be the strongest, you can be the fastest, you can be the best tactician. If you don't take care of your teammates, none of that, none of those other things matter. You, you're you not even wanted in the SEAL teams. That's, that's, that's what it is. So- Well, do you think that that seems to me to be true for, functional organizations in general is that and and certainly the people i've seen this is part of the reason why casual critiques of hierarchies annoy me so much because the people i've seen who are radically successful don't get there from power they get there from ability but also reciprocity and how should a manager use the pareto principle in his favor at work i find myself constantly focusing on the bottom five twenty percent that causes 80 90 five percent of the team's poor performance oh that's easy the managerial literature the solid managerial literature is absolutely crystal clear on this spend all your time with your highest producers and put your lowest producers where they can do the least amount of damage the probability that as a manager you're going to be able to solve the problems of the poorest five to twenty percent of your work uh, team is zero you just don't have the time or the resources at your disposal. So what you should je definitely do in order to increase performance is to concentrate on your top performers. I know that's not what managers do. They do exactly what you say. They focus on the bottom five to 20%, but that's exactly the wrong thing to do as a manager. Focus on your best people. They're hyper productive, as you already know. So, um, you know, maybe you need to reconceptualize the way that you're interacting with your people but you should have regular conversations at least with those that you think are outstanding. Let them know that you really, um, what would you say, 
uh, that you're really happy with their performance and see what you can do to get obstacles the hell out of their way because as a manager essentially what you should be doing is identifying the top performers and then doing everything you can to clear out obstacles in their path that's the right way to think about it and to also to give yourself enough time to develop a medium to long-term plan and, and stop fighting fires on a day-to-day -day basis you need at least 90 minutes a week to think about where you want things to be going in the medium to long term so but i can't overemphasize the importance of dealing with your top productivity your top your highest your most productive people that's where all the gains are that's where all the gains are well, what would you want to be king? You could say king of the world or king of your own soul. What do you want to subordinate yourself to? How about your heroic willingness to encounter the unknown and articulate it and share that with people? There's no nobler vision than that. And I, I don't see that it's merely arbitrary. And so, and it's not merely arbitrary too, because if you do that, to the degree that you do that, assuming your society isn't entirely corrupt, you will be successful. It will actually aid you practically. You'll rise up above men. You'll be selected by women. You'll be admirable. You'll be valued. And, and you know that because if you look at the people that you admire and value, again, unless you've taken a detour into dark places and are, 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 are possessed with admiration for people who are working for malevolent purposes and for destruction you just have to watch the people that you admire and try to figure out what's common across them and draw your own conclusions and you can ask yourself too when you're torturing yourself with your conscience because you're not doing what you should be and you know it what is it that you're torturing yourself in relationship to you have a vision of your own ideal and you torment yourself if you're not matching it what's the ideal well, you don't know, right? It's, it's kind of incoherent and, and poorly articulated, but that doesn't mean it isn't trying to manifest itself and, and make itself known to you. Every social animal, and even many animals who aren't social, are embedded in a dominance hierarchy. The dominance hierarchy has a structure. We couldn't call it a dominance hierarchy. Dominance hierarchy A, B, C, D, E, thousands of them across thousands of years. You extract out from all of them what's central to all of them. That's the pyramid of value. What's the, what's the que what question do you need answered about the pyramid of value? What's at the top? Because that's the ideal. That's the I at the top of the pyramid or the golden Buddha in the, in the lotus. It's the same thing. It's the same thing as the crucifix paradoxically enough and that has to do it has to do with something like the voluntary acceptance and therefore transcendence of suffering it's something like that these are not arbitrary ideas they're deeply that's my case anyways they're deeply 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 rooted in biology and culture they're they're as deeply rooted in biology as the dominance hierarchy is rooted in biology and we already know the answer to that the dominance hierarchy has been around for 350 million years it's a long time you don't get to just brush that off and say well morality is some sort of second order cognitive problem it's like no it's not i mean i can t i can tell you something about its instantiation in your nervous system you have a counter at the bottom of your brain that keeps track of where you are in terms of your status and it bloody well regulates the sensitivity of your emotions so if you're at the bottom of the hierarchy barely clinging on to the world everything overwhelms you and that's because you're damn near dead and so everything should overwhelm you you've got no extra resources any more threat you're sunk so you become extremely sensitive to negative emotion and maybe also impulsive so that you grab while the gr grabbing's good. And if you're nearer the top in the dominance hierarchy and your counter tells you that, then your serotonin levels go up, you're less sensitive to negative emotion, you're less impulsive, you live longer, like everything works in your favor. Your immune system functions better and you're oriented at least to some degree towards the medium and long-term future. And you can afford that because all hell isn't breaking loose around you all the time. And so then the question is, is there a way of being that increases the probability that you're going to move up dominance hierarchies? Well, that doesn't seem to be a particularly provocative proposition unless you think that it's completely arbitrary and random and that you can think that if you want, but I don't think there's any evidence for that whatsoever. I mean, we certainly have 
even for sexual selection, we impose criteria. They're not ram random and arbitrary. This is the dominance hierarchy idea. Dominance hierarchy set themselves up as a matter of course. They're the standard way that animals organize themselves in a territory. Well, okay, human beings are watching those dominance hierarchies. Since we became self-aware, thinking, what the hell are we up to? What the hell are we up to? What's, and, and there's a question that lurks in there, what constitutes acceptable power? What constitutes acceptable sovereignty? Who should lead? Who should rule? What should be at the top? Well, we talked about that. The Mesopotamians figured that out. Speech and vision. That's Marduk. Speech, vision, and the willingness to confront the terrible unknown. That's what should rule. Well, what? Is that an arbitrary idea? Or is that a great idea? How could it be any other way? Well, that's what human beings are like. And I, I don't think that you can read the Mesopotamian story and understand the reference, which isn't an easy thing to do, and fail to draw that conclusion. Marduk has eyes all the way around his head. He speaks magic words. He goes off to fight Tiamat, the dragon of chaos. Well, what's that? That's the reptilian predator that lurks in the unknown. Well, is any of that, is, 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 is there anything about any of that that stands in opposition to what you were pre, would presume if you were just analyzing our situation from a purely biological perspective? We're prey animals, we're predators. We've been threatened by reptiles forever. Why wouldn't we use the predator that lurks in the dark forest or the water as a representative of the unknown? Why wouldn't we harness that circuitry? We already have it at hand. And even more to the point, how could we do anything else? It's, it makes perfect sense. 